Hi guys, um, <clears throat> so welcome to my talk which is called Dr. Strange Data or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Geom. Um, the idea for this talk came to me when I um, was working for a previous client uh, on an application relating to mining and we'd built this um, system that uh, did some processing on user supplied data and it was working beautifully and we just put out our first production, internal production release and uh, it was going really well and then a user came along and buffered 5,000 drill points and um, put them into a, an intersection um, sifter and caused our whole system to blow smoke from the um, enterprise service bus on up and um, we realised that we'd made some very naive assumptions about um, what people might potentially do with the system. Um, and I guess um, expanding on that thought, I just want to give a talk about how often I've experienced this in my career. I think nearly everything that I've built has had um, one of these problems that it's encountered at some stage where we just haven't thought about the extreme range and variation of spatial data. Um, so I guess when you've been working for a while in this, in, in this industry, um, you kind of... Uh, you go through a number of phases and um, there is the first phase where you're talking about geo-referencing and geo-data and geo-rasters and geo-databases and it, it's, um, it, gets, it gets pretty intense. Um, and then there's a period of cynicism where you're just like, well, actually, this is just commodity technology. These are just databases. These are just data types and more and more. Um, this is exactly like making any other kind of application. A map is just a glorified report. Um, but um, the truth is that as you go a little further, there is actually something very special about spatial data. And um, it's not um, so much about the representation or the um, nuts and bolts of the data as the actual being of the data and how spatial records relate to one another. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So I've found, and I've been doing this quite a while, that this job of designing spatial applications and having them work well is quite challenging. Um, for some of the aforementioned reasons. Um, and consequently, a lot of spatial applications have had performance issues. Um, and traditionally what we've done when we've had performance issues in this industry is someone has come along, usually someone extremely clever, and come up with a concept or a paradigm or an idiom or a technology that takes away the pain. Um, so I've had a number of these um, in my sort of lifetime in GIS. I guess the spatial index preceded my career by a bit. Um, we had um, a whole series of image overview, raster pyramid and progressive image delivery technologies happening around about the time that I started working. Um, they got totally blown out of the water by commodity pre-rendered raster tile caches for quite a long time and everyone was just, oh, we're going to build all, all these amazing tiles and it's going to be so great and then we're going to have 300 million tiles in a file system and it's going to be so fun. Um, <laughs> and, and now, you know, sort of, perhaps to a lesser extent, vector tiles are a kind of a, a panacea where a lot of um, the rendering um, is taken out of, out of my hands and, and put on some poor sods device where uh, he has to pay for all of the energy that, that does it. Um, but the pattern has been that we're always um, about our big ideas and when someone like me goes into a client site or gets a new project and goes, oh, what am I going to do? I'm, I always go, oh, I'm going to... I'm going to adopt best practice. This is going to be vector tile based. This is going to be um, straight to the metal on post GIS. You know, this, I'm not going to I'm not going to use that application server anymore, um, and get very caught up in the idea that somehow this is going to solve my problems without actually doing the design work to understand what my problems really are. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an interesting document published called the Reactive Manifesto by. Um, some people who are mainly interested in distributed systems. And um, the Reactive Manifesto has a number of tenets, some of which are pretty controversial. Um, but one of the things that it talks about is upper bounds on performance and the importance of being able to establish worst case performance criterion uh, for your system in order to talk about composing it with other systems and still being able to reason consistently about them. And as I've been saying, pretty much every spatial application struggles with this. Um, we struggle to say to a certainty that um, the processes that we've built are guaranteed to complete in X amount of time, pass that information on to someone else who 
builds an integrated, integrated system and discovers when the rubber hits the road that this truth is actually um, reliable. So this is kind of an idea of what's good about having guarantees versus what's good about having amazing technology like spatial indices and vector tiles. If you have a guarantee about your system, then you know what the worst experience anyone is ever going to get out of it is. Um, and you know that when you join together several systems about, you, about which you know these things, that the worst you're going to get is the combined worst of all of them, right? Um, and so once you've got that information, you can actually make design decisions about how it's going to be presented to end users with a lot of confidence. Because if you know that um, there's a chance that something's going to take minutes to complete, you're not going to try and make it an interactive function. Um, now, that's, that's different from the kind of constant hit and hope of spatial technology best practice, where we take the most performant technical options that we've got and we build something with them, and then later we find out that um, what we've built doesn't work for some reason. Now, these things are not opposites, can't opposed, or can't be used in conjunction with one another, but the point is that we leave out um, what's on the left of this table to a large extent and we stick to what's on the right. And um, I think that's consistent with my experience of this industry. Um, so let's just have a look at a basic spatial operation in, in any spatial application, um, similar to the one I was talking about in the mining related application I worked on. Um, so I've got a user coming in and they're defining an area of interest. So they're interacting with the application to do that, whether by uploading data, sketching data, maybe sketching a bounding box. And then um, there's a set of configured reference layers in the application and they're being intersected with the area of interest, either for extraction, visualization, or um, just to understand what part of the data that's under examination is actually within that area. Um, so one of the nice things about um, open source software is that we can start to reason about um, uh, how well we can expect those kinds of things to perform. Um, so TurfJS, and we just had that excellent um, presentation from Rowan, um, uses an algorithm called the martinez Rueda polygon clipping algorithm to um, do intersections of features. And it turns out that the complexity of this algorithm is um, a complex expression there that you don't necessarily need to understand. But the, the complexity of the algorithm is related to both the size of the inputs and the spatial relations between them. So that k in the O n plus k times log n you see there is the number of intersections between polygon edges in all of the interacting polygons that are fed into this algorithm to produce the final intersection. Now you can't really know that in advance. It's a property of the data that's being put in. And how that property emerges in your data is very, very strange. It's not something that's readily measurable. Um, and it's, it's not something that um, comes out of the way the data is represented, I guess. Um, so what we have is, is a situation where um, we've got this, this data that, that's spatial where each record relates to other records through concepts like proximity, overlap, containment, and those relationships emerge <coughs> through the things that are being recorded. And it, it turns out that it's actually very hard to, as a consequence of things like this complexity expression you're looking at, it's hard to get useful guarantees about what the performance of these algorithms is, is gonna be like with the data that you've got. Um, because you don't know in advance exactly how all of these records are going to interact and there's a host of perverse and degenerate things that can happen. Um, so measuring input data size, not too, not too much of a problem. There's a couple of examples of um, how we can size inputs to this operation in different technologies. Um, but if we want to um, measure spatial relations and how related data sets are, it turns out that we don't have, at least in application development, a well-developed mainstream technical practice that understands how our layers talk to one another and understand one another. On one hand, we have topology, which expresses certain guarantees about how layers might relate to one another, but it's not that widely used and also not always adequate to describe these things. And on, um, on another hand, we have the representation of the data itself, which is just 
a line string is a collection of points, um, a polygon is a collection of exterior rings and, and um, an exterior ring and a collection of interior rings. Um, and these representations don't tell us anything about these tendencies either. So there's something semantic going on here that we don't talk about effectively. And we do have some concepts to talk about it. There's spatial correlation toolkits. Um, it's easy to do proximity analysis between two layers to see how much they overlap when they're buffered by a certain amount or whatever. Um, and you can also do things like to see the spread of a layer by uh, like uh, working out the mean dimensions of the envelope of each feature in a layer or that kind of thing. Um, so, so that's telling you how big the features are, what the extent of the features are in your layer as a kind of a metric on that layer. Which gives you an idea of how likely you're, you are to hit it if you're throwing darts at it, if you know what I mean. Um, and um, the thing is these patterns, although they're a bit obtuse and hard to understand technically, they make a really big difference to how risky it is to allow your user to put 5,000 drill points into your application. Because if that person's going to miss, then um, going to miss all of your data, then that operation's going to take no time. But if they're going to hit your data, then you could be in a lot of trouble, um, especially if you're doing a really naive client-side buffer of 5,000 drill points and getting millions of vertices, which is what I was doing. Um, OK, so. <clears throat> Like I said, this is quite a speculative talk. I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert in this field, and I suspect there's probably whole branches of mathematics devoted to saying how similar geometries are and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know about them, and I don't see people in GIS discussing them yet, but um, in order to practically control this, we can do things like um, find something that, that is definitely going to be computationally cheaper than the full process we want to undertake and is also going to capture some of this information. Like get a dumbed down representation of the whole coverage of the layer that we want to intersect with and intersect with that instead of with the raw detail of the layer that we want to touch. And then when we know um, how much interaction there is between the, the user's area of interest um, and that coverage there is, we can um, decide how we want the application to execute this process, whether we want to try and do it interactively because we believe that it's going to be cheap or whether we want to um, pass it off to an asynchronous system that, that tells the user, this is going to take some time, buddy, or maybe even, I'm sorry, you've asked for too much, you're not paying for this. Um, so um, th these estimates that, that we can produce um, can actually be used to trigger application logic. And there's a number of kind of practical approaches you can take to do that, all with the end goal of never putting a user in a position where they believe they're going to be able to do something and then nonsense happens, um, which is the sort of um, usability crisis that, that, um, that responsive design tries to avoid. Um, so OK, here's some, here's some strategies to mitigate this problem. Um, so we can take measures to simplify um, what users are allowed to do in terms of input data. Um, we can say, sorry buddy, your area of interest can only be a bounding box. Um, so you've only got four vertices to screw me with. Um, you, um, you, can only, you can only cover a certain total area, so you can't choose to try to intersect your data with um, every record in my whole reference library. Um, and you can also create variants of your reference library um, that are simpler, have fewer vertices, are more performant and still fit for purpose for the specific task within the application that you, you want to build. Um, one that's very useful is to prevent users from um, putting needlessly complex data into your system. Um, and this is something that, that um, is actually challenging because uh, when you build these ingest tools, you want to be able to let people put whatever they want in. And if they can't put ever, what, all of their data into your system, they may not be able to use it at all. There may not be a sensible way they can decimate or truncate their data and still find your system usable. So, so there are some challenges here. And the challenges are at this application design business level where you're, where you're really thinking about who your users are and trying to work out what will be satisfactory for them instead of just kind of crunching a number. So it might be, oh, sorry, Bill, you can't have 5,000 drill points, but you can have 500. 
but we're not going to buffer them the same way as we buffer the, the campsites. Um, we're going to use a, a more sensible method and these things filter up and down the technical and, and business kind of uh, domain during the design process. Um, okay, so <coughs> let's run through um, towards the end here because there's a couple of other things I want to talk about before I finish up. Um, okay, so uh, one thing that's been frustrating me lately is um, I work with modern languages and I have these wonderful things called um, property-based testing frameworks where I can basically give um, my framework the schema of the data that I, I have and I can generate beautiful random values in um, numeric ranges, um, valid emails, um, strings, and I can produce this plethora of test data which exercises my application and I can demand that it have parameters that push some of these boundaries so that I know how well I'm performing. Um, now, what I've found, and I would love someone to jump up and correct, correct me, is that there is a pretty poor shortfall of geometry generation tools um, out there. Now, there are some very basic tools. Um, TurfJS provides Turf Random, which uses a radial method to generate polygons. If you go on GIS.StackExchange and you ask how do I generate random geometries in PostGIS? The answers are not rolled gold at the moment. Um, there is st some basic point generation stuff and then there are some kind of ad hoc or simplistic methods for generating geometry. But the geometries that are generated are nothing at all like the ones that you have in real life, especially in that subtle way where, where they relate to one another. So um, this is kind of current output from Turf Random. If I generate geometries around the world, this is, this is 100 random polygons. Um, you just get garbage. And the interrelationship between those records is not going to be similar to the way that the records in your app work. Because what will actually happen is you will have 1,000 geometries right here and none anywhere else. And you'll, you'll think your app is working wonderfully right up until someone hits Antarctica and you know Cthulhu wakes up or whatever. But um, <laughs> it's like a kind of a... Um, uh, it's, it's a very poor representation of, of whatever the ontological being of your spatial data actually is. Um, so where to from here? Well, it's been a, it's a, been a fairly speculative discussion. Um, I'll just kind of cover off on the, the points I've, um, I've raised. In my opinion, we still don't do a great job of building solid and consistent spatial applications. I very rarely encounter a spatial application that um, can't be made to, to um, uh, slow down, blow smoke, have serious problems, crash, and or exhibit nonsensical behaviour. And it's very challenging to do that, but we don't really try. Um, there are a lot of things that are just that should be bread and butter for. Um, people who do the kind of thing that I do, so app development and web application development, um, that aren't being done or are being done as afterthoughts after the first bug reports start coming in. Um, so there's no discussion of practice around this, or very little. Um, and there's probably some really well-established ideas outside of spatial application development that should be being brought into discussions of practice inside spatial development. Um, the way that we talk about big ideas technically tends to obscure um, some of the magic of spatial data. Like there's, there's actually something really, really interesting about, about the way that our layers interact with one another. Um, and it's as yet difficult to quantify and talk about. We don't really have a vocabulary for talking about it um, that I'm aware of. And we've been very fixated for a long time on issues of format, representation, being able to get our Unicode right, being able to have more than 13 characters in a layer name, etc. Um, all those things have obscured the fascinating nature of the data that we're dealing with and we're not talking about it in a, in a way that reflects its, um, its fascinating potential and, it, and, its, and the patterns of its, of its um, relations. And also, um, I'm surprised and kind of um, disappointed, but also kind of, I think it, it's, a, it's a great potential project. Um, I'm, I'm not immediately jumping up to do it myself, but I, I think that um, there's, a, there's a real gap in, uh, in FOS4G for generating geometry um, that feels real. And there's a lot of work being done at the moment in a field called procedural generation that deals with this. 
um, and I think perhaps we can leverage some of it um, and get ourselves a library that we can use across a number of different um, environments to produce meaningful test data. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Okay. Um. Thank you very much. Just on time. So, questions? So, what's the use cases for that? What are the use cases, right? So, um, if you don't know what's coming into your system, then you need to be able to gener generate exemplary data for what a user might do. So, let's say you've got a user upload um, and you've got uh, 10 different kinds of activity data that you've got samples of, you don't know where they're going to be, and you've got um, a handful of really naughty geometries in your reference data, which if they encounter those, you're going to see a performance bug. But your test set doesn't cover that. Then you've got, um, you've basically got a time bomb in your application. So um, that, that's the main one, I think. Could you use like a manually curated test? Because I'm sure there's like a lot of manually curated sample data sets we've had all kinds of you, you really could, um, and I, I think um, procedural generation's obviously got some limitations, so like generated road networks and parcels and stuff, um, they're not real, they don't look real, but they're much more similar in their spatial relation than, and consistent in the some mathematical qualifications around that than randomly generated points. Um, so yeah. There are some tools. Sorry. There are some tools like Nginx come across yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, I've got a rule. Kim, uh, it's a cup of coffee rule. So I tell my students that if the process hasn't finished, by the time their cup of coffee is finished, they have to interrupt it and find a bit of light. <laughs> <laughs> because the chances are they fall into exactly that sort of trap. Yeah, so I should. wait for two days as some people do for nothing to appear. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm focused on building apps for end users. Um, and they just aren't very nice to me. <laughs> I can't tell them to do anything. <laughs> but I, I do appreciate <laughs> that approach, definitely. There are uh, guidelines in the um, uh, operating systems interface area about uh, 0 0.11, 10 seconds. So 0 0.1 uh, second of reaction to any interaction. Mm. Um, one second to accomplish something reasonable. And if something takes more than 10 seconds, you have to provide a feedback. Have you encountered or used any of these kind of Yes, styles? absolutely. I mean, the projects that I've worked on have had those kinds of non-functional requirements. Not usually as stringent as that. Um, 10 seconds is pretty normal. Um, I think for an interactive operation, you want it to be down to one to three seconds max. I think people expect and give a little leeway for the kinds of things that we build. Um, so that, you know, they're happy to see a spinner for a little bit. Um, provided there's a spinner. The spinner is already yeah. a feedback, right? So yeah, yeah. you should have a spinner if stuff takes more than 10, 10 yeah, seconds. But it this girl has a explained <coughs> optimization built into it for database operations. Mm. So we should have something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting how this talk kind of came into being. I guess I've, when I first went into this, I was like, maybe I can actually produce these guarantees. And what I realised was, I don't think I can. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a point of frustration. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the inability to do that calculation up front without actually doing the whole job in the first place, it's kind of uh, a bit like the halting problem or something, you know, but it's... Uh, it's a very brutal kind of it, so yeah. We'll have to stop it there. You yeah, guys sure. can continue over coffee. Uh, thank you very much once more.